Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word. This morning we're going to focus on our Old Testament reading, which is the beginning of God's response to Job in Job chapter 38. We begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, 904, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. We turn to page 219 for the Order of Matins. Oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our psalm of the day comes to us from Psalm 18, the first 16 verses in the front part of your hymnal. Please note there are no page numbers. The psalms are simply in numerical order. And we will read Psalm 18, verses 1 through 16, responsibly half verse by half verse. That means I read up to the red asterisk, and you as the congregation respond with the rest of the verse. We read responsibly Psalm 18, the first 16 verses. I love you. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. The cords of death encompassed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I cried for help. Then the earth reeled and rocked. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. He bowed the heavens and came down. He rode on a cherub and flew. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Out of the brightness before him, The Lord also thundered in the heavens. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. Then the channels of the sea were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare. He sent from on high, he took me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. Now invite any children forward for a special message. Well, good morning, Ryan. Yeah, Eli's leaving you out to hang, isn't he? Yeah. All right. All right. You know what this is supposed to be? Say it nice and loud. A crown. That's right. And who wears crowns? Kings wear crowns. That's right. Who is the king of the world? God is. So God can and should be wearing a crown, right? Yeah. Well, our Old Testament reading for today, God reminds Job that he is the king of the world. He made this world. He controls the seas. He makes the sun to rise. God is the king of the world. But in the surprise of all time, this king became human. He saw that humans had broken his perfect world, so he became human, the person of Jesus, to wear a crown of thorns, to die on the cross so he could redeem and save all of us living in this world. And that's what Jesus came to do, to be the king of the world. He came to seek you out, to suffer and die because he loves you. Let us pray. O king of creation, we give you thanks that your son became human, offered his life on the cross so that we could have a place in your kingdom forever and live under your gracious and merciful rule. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, Ryan, for coming on up. We continue our worship with hymn number 758, The Will of God is Always Blessed.
Our Old Testament reading for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from the book of Job, the 38th chapter, verses 4 through 18 on page 565 in your pew Bibles. And our Old Testament reading is part of God's response to Job's repeated cries for answers after his suffering. But the response of God is probably not what Job expected. God gives a series of questions that reminds Job and us that God is God and we are not. God proclaims to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of dark, deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. O Lord, have mercy on us. Our epistle reading comes to us from Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 5 through 17, starting on page 1211. And the Apostle Paul reminds us in this reading that salvation does not come through the law, but through believing in the word of Christ. But this word must be proclaimed so that all may hear this great message. Paul writes, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless, unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring, who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Please stand for the gospel reading. And the Holy Gospel is according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 22 through 33, on page 1048. And this Gospel reading is the account of Jesus walking on water. And we see the truth in this text clearly, that Jesus is Lord, as he both walks on water and pulls Peter out of water to safety. We read, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not. Be afraid. 
And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Well, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. O Lord, have mercy on us. We continue with the common responsory at the bottom of page 221 in our hymnal. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's an acronym that people like to use to try to teach others about the Bible. Right? That the Bible itself, that word, is an acronym. Basic information before leaving earth. In other words, the Bible is a book about how you get into heaven, how you get into God's kingdom. It's a collection of stories inspired by God so that you can believe and have eternal life. Another way to look at the Bible is that the Bible is what God chose to reveal himself to you. Perhaps this is why some people want a special revelation from God or or some type of apocalyptic vision so they have more info about God. But the Bible is God revealing himself to you, the parts that he wants you to know. Most important, that you're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. To understand this, perhaps Job is the best book to to grasp this, that the Bible is simply what God wants to reveal of himself to you. For example, go to the beginning of the book of Job. God pulls the curtain back, and we get a glimpse of how God is working. But we find a very shocking scene. God talking with Satan, the accuser, the adversary. It leads us to more questions than answers. How does God do this? Why? Doesn't he have something better to do? How is the devil even able to meet with God? The questions start rolling around in our heads and fly out of our mouths as we get this glimpse of God in a way that we have not seen before. Almost as if it's a reminder that that there are parts of God we can't grasp, we can't comprehend, we can't deal with, and we can't understand. But the light shines on God and Satan and reveals a scene that we don't really like and causes to have more questions than answers. Now fast forward to our text in Job 38. For the last 30 plus chapters, Job has complained to God, God, why are all these evil things happening to me? He's been dialoguing with his friends His friends think they have the right answers. Job's trying to answer why these things are happening. He questions God. He demands that God meet him in court. He wants answers from God himself. 
And our text is the beginning of God's answer to Job's demands and questions. But they're simply a series of questions back to Job. Has anyone here read a long series of books or watched a long TV series where you just couldn't wait to get to the end to have your questions answered? Answers that the book or the show have raised for you in its telling, in its plot line, only to get to the end and be utterly disappointed. Anyone had that experience? Anybody want to tell us what show or books those were? Game of Thrones. There's one. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll give you two. Okay? All right, so there's one show that I really liked that made everyone question everything. You get to the end and their answers were, might have been the most disappointing answers ever. That TV show, Lost. Oh, good. Someone agrees with me. Actually, everyone agrees with me if you watch that show. Another show, more recent, way more recent. For 10 seasons, we watched in The Blacklist this criminal mastermind, Raymond Reddington, and they raise all these questions in the show. Who is Raymond? Who is really Raymond Reddington? What's with this fire that they keep referring to? And on and on the questions go. And we get to the end of season 10, and we're expecting all our questions to be answered. And they answered none of them. Eh, who cares about that? They just wanted to end the story. Anyone, any, anyone with me watch The Blacklist? I'm to the point, don't even watch it. Don't even watch it. It's 10 seasons that are going to just disappoint you at the end. And that's sort of the feeling you can get when you read the book of Job from beginning to end. You listen to Job's questions and complaints. But then when God answers Job, God's answer is sort of a letdown but it reminds us of who God is and what he does and doesn't want to tell us about him. God's answer, it's an amazing response because it's like three chapters long, but God's answer to Job's questions are a series of 70 questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who laid its cornerstone? Who shut the sea with doors? Who commands the mornings? Have you ever entered the springs of the sea? Have you walked the deeps of the, or walked the deeps? Perhaps the question that best summarizes God's response to Job is the first one, but it's not in our text. Who is this that darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? God is God, you are not. That's the summary of God's response to Job. Now I'm amazed that there are 70 questions in response to Job in chapters 38 to 41. But these answers are not really satisfying answers. Job's an response to God's answer was to be quiet and to carry on with his life. And he went back to living his life faithfully despite not getting the answers that he wanted or desired. Job was trying to find the hidden parts of God, and God says, no, you don't get to see those parts, Job. And that's hard for all of us. There are parts to God and his will that we just can't understand. Usually it's found in the tragedies of life. Childhood cancer. Injustice homelessness, mental illness, car accidents, failures, addictions, miscarriages, premature deaths. How could God allow these things to happen? Why would God do this to me? Why does God remain silent in my suffering? This is a reality that we all have to face in our lives. Some of them may seem more serious or more scary than others. But they all lead us to the same questions. Why, God? How come, God? Why not this way? Don't you care about me? 
in the book of Job as a reader, we get the answer to Job's questions. Why at the beginning of the book, when we get that glimpse of God and Satan? And it's not a satisfactory answer. I sometimes wonder if God would answer our questions, why if we would get less than a satisfying answer from God if he really responded to our questions. But here's where faith comes in. We believe that this God, our triune God, is the one who laid the foundations of the earth. He's the one who had the plumb line in his hand as he measured everything out, the depths of the sea and the height of the mountains. He laid the first pieces and the last pieces and all the pieces in between. God made the morning star sing a beautiful chorus. God brought, brings the sun to rise each day and set each night. God set a bar around the sea and says, thus far and no farther. This is the God we believe in. He's the one who made this world, this universe, out of nothing. He's the one who knows all, sees all, and understands all. And in his love, after we messed up his perfect world, after we messed up the oceans and the seas, after we brought sickness and despair into this perfect world through our sin, he doesn't throw us onto the trash heap. Even when you end up looking like Job, sitting in mourning upon ash, ashes and in sackcloths for a week, God hasn't abandoned you. When he refuses to answer your questions, why and how come, God hasn't turned his back on you. He's redeemed you. He's loved you when you were prickly and challenging. He cared for you when you didn't want anything from him. He provided the sun and the rain, whether you cared or not. He even invites you to darken his counsel with your prayers. But here's the most amazing part of the story. The one who laid the foundations of the earth, the one who measured everything, the one who laid the cornerstones of the world, the one who shut the sea with doors, the one who commands the morning, the one who enters the springs of the sea and walked into the depths. He was the one who became human. He was the one who walked on the sea in our gospel reading for today. He became human, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who built this world, came to be a suffering servant so that he could do more than answer your questions. He came to be the answer to it all. He came to be the Redeemer, the Creator, the Life-Giver, the Forgiver. And when you have to deal with things like childhood cancer, Jesus is there for you. When an accident interrupts your life, Jesus is the one who has conquered, conquered all for you. When all these sinful, terrible things can, ha can and do happen to you, it's the cross of Jesus it's there that he's come to bear it all for you. That these evil things don't get the last word. They don't get to mock God and go unchecked. We may not be able to grasp why everything happens. We may not know why. But we know Jesus. He knows what it's like to suffer and die. And he offers you through that cross hope and victory that this world can't take away. For the revealed, God, the revealed God in our scriptures is a God of mercy and hope. And although it doesn't answer all of our questions, the most important ones are answered. How am I saved? Does God really love me? How do I get into his kingdom? Does God exist? Who is God? For the answer is Jesus. And it always will be. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We now continue our worship by singing our next hymn, 702, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
We now turn to the back cover of our hymnal for the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. We confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn to hymn number 941. We praise you, O God, and acknowledge you, O God.
Please be seated for our offering. We continue our worship with the order of prayer on page 227 with the Kyrie. In our prayers this morning, remember those listed in our bulletin. We also uh, remember Ruth Sheeler in our prayers, who was hospitalized this past week. We uh, pray for Janet Anderson, and we also pray for the family and friends of Frank Crum. That is uh, David Matrix's uh, brother who died this past week. Please stand for prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Almighty and most merciful God, preserve us from all harm and danger, that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish what you want done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Almighty God, you laid the foundations of the earth and set bounds and limits to all things. We give you thanks for your glorious creation, including your own bodies and souls. In our sin, we have earned for ourselves death, and your creation has been subjected to fertility. Yet in your Son, you grant us forgiveness and new life. Help us to live in righteousness through faith in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, your word is near to the hearts of your people. Grant them courage to speak the gospel faithfully before the world. Let those who hear confess Jesus Christ as Lord and be saved. Remember all who endure persecution for his name and strengthen them for a bold witness. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, we ask you to raise up pastors, teachers, missionaries, and servants for all church work vocations. Bless church planters and new congregations that they may endure. Bring hope and renewal to all struggling congregations and to the pastors who serve them. Do not let fear keep us from your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. Help us to trust in you at all times, Father, that we may not doubt or fear. Grant us confidence in all that you have promised to bestow daily and richly upon your people. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, you supported Peter in his doubts and fears. Keep us from sinking into despair when we suffer the trials of this mortal life. Be with those who are in need, especially Ruth, Janet, Marge, Eileen, Jane, Stacy, David, Jerry, Helen, Carol, Helen, Shirley, Bridge, Elmer, 
Marion, Phil, and Allie. Grant us your spirit that our hearts may not waver, and keep us in the grasp of your grace that we may not lose our way or be overcome by weariness and struggle. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of comfort, you have come through your Son, Jesus Christ, to conquer death for all, especially all who believe in you. We pray that you be with the families of Frank and Brandon, that they may know of your victory over death through Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Grant that all who come to Trinity Lutheran Church and School would know of your great love and care and be led by your Spirit into everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings be ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we remain standing for our closing hymn, 918, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's words. We're reminded that God reveals his mercy and graceful side through his word to each of us. Um, golf outings today, right, Jim and Dave? You know, my app told me all week 95% chance of rain. Um, now it's down to 25% chance. So your, so your prayers have helped us out. Yes, yes, yes. And this is a tennis player and tennis coach talking. And I always would say the best days for tennis were cloudy days so that you wouldn't have to look up into the sun. You know, for Scott Rockwell, who drives his ball up 500 feet in the air, now he doesn't have to stare into the sun on a sunny day, and it's easier to track his ball. Yeah, all right. So that's today. Next Sunday, we have uh, Team Trinity at 4 o'clock. So any 6th uh, grade through 12th graders are welcome to join us in the basement uh, next Sunday, 4 o'clock. Any other announcements? None? 
Then let's conclude with the Bible verse of the month. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. God's blessings to you this week.